Institutions don't care about retail investors. You're in the market with robots and giants and giant robots. You gotta try not to get stepped on. Hey friends, this is Podcast Ruined by Software Engineer. I am Perry Sue, and on this episode, I get to talk to George Kalis, CEO of Prospero AI a financial intelligence platform providing hedge fund level key signals and AI driven insights all in the palm of your hand. If you enjoy Podcast Room by Software Engineer, don't forget to hit the follow button on your podcast app so you don't miss out on the new episodes. And you can pick up podcast merch at paritsu.com slash shop. Enjoy the episode. Welcome back to another episode of Podcast Room by Software Engineer. Today with me is George Kalis, CEO of Prospero AI. George, how are you? I'm doing great. It's a Friday. It's beautiful out. Might hit the pool later. <laughs> That's so good. And it's funny because we literally have been talking for the past maybe 10, 20 minutes about just life in general. And not only that, it's because so much of, but also just like a particular part, the finance world, the tech world, you have so much experience and baggage with you. I just say thanks again for being on the show because I can't wait to get into all of that. Me too. I was like our first conversation, you kept on being like, well, I don't want to ruin it for the show. And I was like, yeah, there's some good answers I got for you here. So I'm excited to get into it too. Yeah. But something that I do want to ask you before anything is maybe like a 30 second blurb. Who is George and what is Prospero AI? Well, I am someone that cares very deeply about fairness in the world. And I would say for a long time, as we can probably get, I, I've wanted to create mechanisms for that and saw finance as a prime way to do that. And that's what we're doing today. Prospero AI is trying to level the playing field for retail investors. We've invented signals to make complex things like where institutions are trading options easy for people to understand and apply without having to understand what options are at all, which is something that is a, a later stage learning for a lot of people and people shouldn't attempt. So, you know, we're doing very well. We've our newsletter picks that kind of teach how to use the signals have beaten the market by about 50 percent each of the last two years and 80 percent this year. So. It's been great to help people in these tangible ways. And like, you know, I'm sure we'll get into it. One of my favorite parts about Prospero is all the people that have actually come in the felt into the fold because we've made them money or like they've like changed their lives in some some kind of ways. We have our first full time data scientists that have actually known for five years. I know that's a little like longer than 30 seconds, but we'll we'll let you run the show here, Perry. No, I think even just the way you're saying all that, I think it's, how, how would I call this? Like, I wouldn't say that I'm an evangelist of this, but the bridging the gap, right? Always offering more tools. And you can see that these tools are not forced onto people. Like, it's generally not to be like, oh, you have to live with this day to day. But then when you discover it, I, I obviously played around with it a little bit. I already explored like the content that you guys got out there. It's so curious. And I could definitely see why people are more and more interested into that. But one thing I do want to put into perspective with a lot is that you didn't learn all of this in a single day. You didn't learn how to, the, the tricks behind this finance, so even running this operation, like you didn't, that definitely did not take a day. So maybe like when you grew up, what did your environment look like? Did you have like a lot of people or maybe even where did you grow up to begin with? What is home to you? And did that environment had already a lot of this influence of whether it's like finance or maybe even tech or because I definitely didn't know mobile apps maybe wasn't a thing back then, but describe us a little bit. Yeah, so so I grew up in New York City, so like not too far like up in that that direction actually from from here. Uh and yeah, I mean to go like very early, right, not a day, but I think for me it's like even more like that way. Like I actually didn't find out until I was 25 that I actually started talking about what Prospero would be someday when I was 7. I wrote a story about it that my mom was like saving for the right time to give me cuz I was a bit of a jerk when I was when I was younger. Like, that's kind of what happens if you put, like, I would call, like, an adult mind in a child's body. Uh, and and so, like, I always had these big ideas. I started to, uh, I actually started to invest when I was 13. Around that time, I also came in second place in a Monopoly tournament with a bunch of investment bankers. Uh, just, like, sitting at a table. I was obviously the only kid there. My mom thought it would be really funny uh, to put me into that. But... Yeah, it was kind of like where we started. I, I think my passion was always like, okay, I, I want to see more fairness in the world. Like, for example, like one of the things that like kind of triggered these events and wanting to change things was I always, when I saw homeless people in New York, I always thought that that was really weird and I didn't get good answers about why they existed. And I could say that's kind of like the earliest, like that I could trace it to of just being like, wow, things are really unfair. Like, 
And the funny part is, I think my parents, when I would always kind of like, I was always big on fairness and talking about it. I like my parents actually took to telling me like, life's unfair. Like they actually try to like kill that instinct in me. But like, I think one of the things that like I've said, it's like, okay, maybe it's unfair for me, but I really like to make it more fair for other people. So like, that's how I started in finance. Like I obviously had this investing experience and like my first investing experience was pretty funny. It was in the tech bubble. My uncle has worked on in finance for a long time. He actually gave me a stock tip and, and it like went way up. And then, and then of course the tech bubble like down and like the next time I saw him, I was like, what happened? Why didn't you tell me to sell? Like, 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 and are you like, basically are you still learning? He was like, oh, I sold that a while ago. He was like, well, why didn't you, like, why didn't you tell me? He was like, there's your first lesson in finance. Nobody's on your team. Like, and, and so I did take that to heart, um, among other things, but I really wanted to learn. And, and my first job was at Columbia Business School. I worked for a pretty prominent business school professor at, at the Center for Value Investing, Bruce Greenwald. And, you know, I got that job similar to how I got a lot of my early jobs, which is just that, like, I was never really intimidated by people. I had these, like, higher goals. I think purpose is so important in life. And I just kind of went in there. I was like, I want the job. I can do it. I want to learn from you. I want to be a great investor. And, like, basically the way you described it, he was like, he was like, I've had MBA students that didn't come in with, like, half of that fire, which is, by the way, who I normally hire for this job. Um, so, like, that kind of thing like got me started, you know, I, through him, I met like actually my first hedge fund job uh, where I uh, like kind of similarly, I met him through Bruce and he like kind of offered me a job and I showed up on his doorstep my senior year of high school. I was down at Stuyvesant, so not far from like, you know, where a lot of Wall Street was. And I showed up and I emailed him and he took the meeting. And then when I got there, he was like letting me down. Like he was prepared to let me down at least. And he was like, look, you seem really smart. I think it's cool that you followed up. I wanted to tell you in person, like you can't do this job. Like you are, you don't know accounting and we're value investors. Like, yeah, you did a summer at Columbia, but like we're real value investors here and you just need to know accounting. And just like without hesitation, I said, I'll learn. And, and he was like, okay, here's what we're gonna do. I will buy you some textbooks. You can come in to our offices as much as you want. And you tell me when you're ready to take your accounting test. You're not going to know what's on it. Like, you just have to read these books. You just have to learn. Like, you tell me this is real life. This is a hedge fund that you're trying to work at. Like, you get one test, you pass. I'm going to pay you the same as I pay the rest of my analysts. Like, you fail. There is no job, no second chance. And so I went in four days a week after school. I took Fridays off, but I went to school, went in, learned. I mean, I will have to say the other analysts were like so amused by this whole situation that they really helped me. And that's great because like finance can be very competitive, but that was a very nurturing environment for sure, where they're like, he's probably going to, he like, he talks about this all the time. He's probably going to ask you about this. Like you should learn it. So you know, that was how I like, were like, that's how I got my start in finance. And like, the thing about finance is like, you know, it's so much like, what have you done already? And like, even track record and like, you know, obviously I couldn't have a great investment track record as like a teenager, but like having a track record of getting jobs, like definitely helped me get other jobs. And I like, we could dig into any of these, but I'm just going to like stream kind of a little to my first company, but like, I worked at Bear Stearns in mortgage finance in the summer of 06, which is crazy. Like, and then I, I worked at some buy side. I worked at some other buy side funds. I would like my first job out of college. I worked at a single family office as the only other person other than um, the person that ran it. And that was a really formative experience for me for a variety of reasons. Um, the first being that like, you know, I've kind of alluded to some of these lessons. And I think that like, you know, if as we zoom forward a little bit, what Prospero is, it's like a culmination of all of my lessons, all of the holes that I've seen in terms of the information that I've tried to fill with good technology. Like, but this one in particular, like, was my experience of like why I even got into tech, which is my boss was the largest holder of two print yellow pages companies. 
and uh, and he was investing tons of money into them, even as the stock was going down. And I was buying them too because I was like, okay, this is what I'm here for—to learn from this guy. And if he's buying them, I'm buying them too. Um, and so I went in and I was like building these like complex debt models that he like was showing me and basically like to explain it in like the very simplest terms. Uh, we had basically modeled out that if they bought back the debt because it was trading so cheaply and, and, you know, one of the ways is paying back debt, but you can like, if it's trading on the secondary market cheap enough, you can just buy it back. And it was trading so cheaply, they could have used the substantial amount of cash that they had on their books to, you know, basically not, um, you know, not trip their leverage ratio covenants, which basically just means if they didn't maintain a certain debt to income ratio, like their debt holders could, you know, put them through some kind of bankruptcy proceeding um, or restructuring. And so here I was, I had saved a lot of money, I had invested well, and, you know, when this happened, I lost like six figures of my like hard earned, like starting my career young. And I'll never, I'll never forget walking into my boss's office and uh, being like, what the hell? Like, like this thing, like I'm wiped out. Like, what are you doing? Like, like, I don't know what I'm doing here. I thought you knew what you were doing. And he was just like, who the fuck told you to do that? And I was like, I was like, I was executing your trades. I thought you told me to do that. But he was like, he was like, no, I'm suing these companies. Like as their largest shareholder, he's like, you are wiped out. Like I am going to make a return on this. And like, sure enough, he made like a 10 X return. And I had like over a 90% loss in the class action lawsuit that followed his lawsuit. And so like all of this stuff where they basically like intentionally filed for bankruptcy, not illegal. I found out what, what he did get them for was like misrepresenting their bad debt expense and basically misleading him as an investor. And that's like the true barbell nature of how this works. As a largest shareholder, he did like leverage buyouts. He's like, this is my historical return, what I would have made if they didn't like, you know, skirt the laws. So that was a very interesting, and you know, not only was that an interesting experience, a lot of people called me that saw he was um, the largest shareholder and would be like, what are you guys seeing here? Like, why are you buying the shares? Like, and I'm like, oh, trust me, I've worked on these debt models this isn't going anywhere, like we're safe, I'm personally invested. And then those people like, not only did I have like the personal loss, these people that I had developed relationships with, like, were like, what the fuck? Like, George, you screwed me over basically, like you reassured me, like when this happened. So like, there was a variety of lessons there. The big thing tying it back to Prospero was like, I was like, honestly, like my boss at that time, he was very sharp. And, you know, one of the life lessons that he, he taught me that, you know, people have asked me sometimes what my biggest one was. And I actually, it's, it's this, and it's kind of obvious, but shortly, like when I started working for him, he was like, he, he pulled me aside. He's like, George, you're a smart guy. Like I see you looking for shortcuts all the time. And that's what smart people do. But he's like, look at me. He's like, there are no shortcuts. Like there are no shortcuts in investing. And so that was a very important thing that I learned from him, but we were doing this like deep, deep value analysis. And there was nothing I could see in it that basically said like their secure debt holders intended to like make a return by putting them through bankruptcy. And like, like unless you have other contacts on Wall Street, which you like can't depend on, and like a lot of people do, I would have had no way of knowing that. I don't honestly know if he knew it or not, but anyway, that's when I was like, that's when value investing betrayed me. And I started on this path of tech being like, there are real underlying market equations and I'm going to figure out what they are. Cause like this bullshit I've been sold about like value investing being the truth, you know, Warren, Warren Buffett method, like whatever, like that did not cover this. And like, you know, it's kind of like that old football expression, like where it's like, you're only as good as your worst player on defense. So like, if I can't, if you're missing big things like that, 
you're not a good investor. And that's, you know, going back to like where I started when I was 16, I wanted to be a good investor. And like, I was just like, this isn't it. One thing I'll, I'll mention to begin with is that like, there's people who are just reactionary to their environment. Some people who just let stuff happen to them and they just go with it. But I feel like everything you've mentioned is we're a little bit counter to that. Life gives you punches, you punch back. And that's kind of the thing where every lessons that you've gone, even from early on in the sense of like, wait, life is not fair. Life just sucks sometimes and everything. Well, you got to do something about it. But um, talk to me as a, as, a, as a 13, 14, 15 year old. What is investing? So it is kind of funny. Sometimes when people are like being like really obstinate with me about like, cause I teach people online sometimes. I'm just like, I was like, I was, I was like, I accepted some truths as a 13 year old learning to invest that you're not accepting. Like you gotta like, you gotta realize where you're starting from and like have some wisdom. Like even then I was like, you know, thinking about that, but it was just like, that's just like a funny aside. Like for me then, it was really just that I wanted to learn and I didn't have like, you know, I didn't have any illusions about like, you know, and, and the two primary investments I made. And it's like, one is like exactly what you shouldn't do. And one is exactly what you should. Like what I shouldn't have done was ask my uncle for the tip. Like it was a stock called Gemstar. It was like a VCR company or something. I don't know, like, and that is bad. Asking people for tips, without any real knowledge of what's going to move the stock on your own is terrible. It's a terrible way of going about things. And a lot of people do it that way. And some of the, some of the things that I tell to people sometimes is they're just like, well, should I follow you this or that? Or whatever? And I'm just like, I think you should, I think you should take what I say and figure out what makes sense for you. Like, I don't want you to follow. Like the moves I make are with way more experience than you. Like I try to talk in languages that you can understand. And that's one of the reasons we invented the signals. Cause like, we'll get to it later, but a really easy thing is like, one of them is literally called uh, like our long-term signals upside and downside. So like a really easy thing I could say to people is like, I was like, don't buy a stock where the downside's higher than the upside. Like little things like that. It just like, that makes communication easier where it's like, you don't have to have a full education to be able to do that. But the other thing of the example of like, good investing is like I bought E-Trade and I bought E-Trade because I set up my account on E-Trade. I thought it was like, I thought online stock buying was like going to be a really big trend and it wasn't really at the time. Um, and that was like a really good investment that, that I made um, for the right reasons. Of course, like the tech bubble, E Trade like went way down from when I was like I probably like I think I like quadrupled the money that I that I put in. Which by the way, I I I harangued my mother for uh for the inheritance that my like my step grandfather had left me um until she gave it to me, which was a, a many uh it was a many month uh process. Um, but I think you know she saw that I was serious about it. I don't think she would have handed it over day one. But the fact that like this re retained my interest for a few months, I think she was like, you know what, if you lose it, you lose it. Like, like this is like clearly something that's important to you. Um, and, and of course, like, yeah, if I, if I look to one thing that even like got me in, like interested in being in it at 16, like that was a really good, like, like start, like seeing the tech bubble kind of getting my ass handed to me a little bit. Like if it had gone the other way, I might've never like wanted to work at Columbia Business School. I might've made the same mistake that a lot of people made, which is like, thinking I'm a good investor before I'm actually a good investor. Like if I just had those huge returns. But I think the other thing is like, all of those things are right um, on the like investment thesis part. Um, but I think the other thing is like, just as a general lesson, like protect gains. Like if you're at like a four X return, like, by the time you get to a 2x return, just like grab it. It's going in the wrong direction. Don't like, hope is not a strategy. I say this to people all the time, but it's just like, that's the one thing where it's just like, and some people use stop losses that might be too complicated or whatever, but it's just like, just protect your gains. And that's like a really easy answer. And like, I know I said four and two, it's just like, if you have like a certain amount of gain and that gain is cut in half, that's generally a good rule. You can always buy back, right? You can always say like, oh, like 
it went down 2x, like, I, and then, like, you know, I had 4x, and then it was 2x. Let's just use real numbers because this is getting confusing. Like, bought the stock at 10, it's at 40, like, then I see it go to 20, take your 2x gain, right? You could always buy it back at 30 where you're like, oh, this is turning around again. And you still, you know, retain that gain. You see it going back in the other direction. That's way better than just seeing it like plummet where I ended up like going below the original amount I invested. And that's like the difference between like tactics and like forming a good investment thesis. And if you're forming a good investment thesis that you believe in, you see a trend, like you have some insight. Like one of the things I actually was like in a laptop program the first year when I was in fifth grade. So I was using computers for a while. So I had a good insight to being able to be like, oh, like I saw it come along. And I was like, oh, like this is way different than when I even started using the internet two years ago when I was in seventh grade. I was like, there wasn't even anything like this. I think this represents a trend, right? So that's right. And then you're going to learn tactics. And I think that that's the most important part, like being patient with a learning journey on tactics, because you probably will only learn tactics by losing money, to be honest. Like, and like, if you haven't lost money yet, like that should be a big sign that you should take your gains because like no one, especially someone that's just on like a beginner's journey, just doesn't have that big loss. It comes for everyone. It marks. It definitely marks a lot of it. And I really like the the understanding that you're saying, like, forget about the multipliers, let's talk about numbers. And even for me to translate it, even, even easier to be like, if you started with one apple and then you ended up with four, when it comes down to do, just take the two apples. You still got one more than the initial one at the yeah. end of the day. So it's very digestible, everything you're saying, because those are good, good, good tips in a sense of take your wins. Hope is not a strategy. It's the first time I hear that. I'll definitely be maybe using it. I'll give. I'll make sure I give credit to that. But that is absolutely something that should be. You know, people should should have that drilled into them at some point. Um, it was a really good segue at the same time where you're talking about technology and what you were using as a program or anything like that. Because obviously Perry, as a as a geek, as a software engineer, as any as a technologist at the end, I geek out about this stuff nowadays. Even when you're mentioning like e trade and online trading and the first time that's like free stock trading, free like. ETFs that you get to buy back then what is it banks are like charging 10 15 20 bucks I can't remember whatever it was yeah I think I was paying like 14 dollars a trade <laughs> that's a bit mental isn't it but then like nowadays you have all these tools but let's reel back a little bit when you're talking about the initial phase of the first time maybe even the first time you use the computer because I mean like people take it for granted nowadays that you can use a computer to do stocks but back then was it like that as in like did you have to like make a phone call to make a stock so maybe describe me maybe the technology behind it as like a human living through this evolution of no internet ish what apps did you use back then how did you even get your orders in so i had a i had a 14 for modem and that was my first thing it's the one that like made the noise as it was connecting to the internet used a phone line and like i actually remember like my first internet journey because it's so funny i went in and i just like because google solves this now for you and it's just like so funny like i was like typing words into it and i was just getting error pages like and i was like the internet sucks like i was like i'm typing in all this stuff i like everybody tells me the internet's amazing but like i'm typing all of these like words like you know computer games and things and i was just getting like i was like you literally can't find anything on the internet is <laughs> like, is it was my first experience with the internet. But then you had like AOL, like I can't remember, I think E-Trade was an app in AOL. Like that was my first experience with it. And like, you know, I remember, you know, I guess because I wanted to play computer games, I did learn some basically like DOS programming because you had to like pull up, you had to like run the command. Um, but like, even then, like, I don't think I, I, I didn't, I don't think I remember using an internet browser until like, maybe like, four years later from when I got that computer, like in high school, like it was like, either like, it was either like finding things on AOL and like the embedded apps in AOL, or like running games on, on like the command line and dots. Um, but yeah, it's like really funny. Like I always like, I love that like first experience with the internet. 
like and just remembering my like my like supreme disappointment like and i remember like ranting to my family about it like after because like my sister who was two years older like we were the our fifth grade class was the first year and like my younger sister like couldn't like give two shits about that um but like i remember i remember just like my my like just like we were at dinner and just like ranting to them about how terrible the internet was and like how ridiculous it was that people were like talking about it as like being the, like this huge thing in the future which is just like so funny like you know i i love i love like looking back on ourselves as we're younger and just being like oh my god like that like not only was i off i was like like just like tremendously off but like if we could draw the tie it's just like there's there's something powerful about being wrong about something that like i think makes you learn about it more makes you like because i think part of that was i think i might have like said that to someone else who then like one of my other friends who had a computer like was in the laptop program but had actually been using computers before that i was just like no like you're an idiot like <laughs> like like you don't know how to use the internet it's like not the internet is not the problem it's you and then me being like a little embarrassed in, in front of some of my friends and and like wanting to learn and the thing is, like, you're adventurous enough to do it. I keep on saying this, that, like, I, I mean, even for me to be, like, how do you do an online trade to begin with? Or even back then, I'm just being, like, how do you even download a game? How do you even get AOL going? Is that unless the best part is somebody doing it for you, so you, you see them use it and you see them do it, and then that's how you that's how you learn, basically. But I feel like a lot of stuff that gets available to you, whether it's a computer, whether it's, <laughs> like, a terminal, even from back then, you're able to just take that and just play around with it and that kind of is something like a like a behavior thing if anything that helps you do what you do today because you have to be probing you have to be active about this stuff so i love hearing about the technologies from back then um shout out to the aols i i was surprised you even to get a trading app on the on the actual aol app to begin with so that is amazing technology that i could think of one thing that is um Maybe this is my curiosity more than anything, because we're going to get into uh, Prospero, but also even just a bit before that, you also worked out a bit at Instadot as well. But then even before that, there was also this, I guess, like analyst role and associate role. And for me to be something of a, I keep on saying layman, but somebody that is not fully in the finance world is, what is the distinction? Because like for me, I understand what an analyst is. I understand what associate is in the finance world. And of course, like the journey keeps on going, but maybe just very briefly of what does a day of, an analyst do, especially work at hedge funds, because an analyst could be at, you know, at big banks as well and other stuff. So maybe just the, the like a typical day-to-day -day of what you remember back then, at least. Maybe it's different today, but describe me the day-to-day -day of an analyst and maybe how is it different than an associate? So actually, one of the things that I love about the analyst title in the hedge fund world is like, other than, um, you know, maybe like a trader or like a chief investment officer, like, analysts can be paid like millions of dollars like it sounds like an entry-level position in a lot of other companies it is but like there's a wide range and some people just like they stay in their zone they're just very good they make good picks and like that's all they do and you can get paid very handsomely as an analyst but you could also just be like a summer analyst like that's that's what i love about a position like that um associate tends to uh tends to be something that's like very, very different. It tends to be like, that is a straight entry level position. And that's kind of like how they like mask you doing kind of like, I would say, you know, maybe like different kinds of menial jobs. Like, like one of my favorite jobs, I was, I started as an associate and I was just like selling non-performing loan pools. Um, we would buy them from banks, we would package them. And like I was making cold calls and I'm actually like there were two pieces of advice that um, that made me take that job because I am more of like a pensive like I am more of an analyst like I want to look at information. I don't necessarily contrary to this like my instinct is not to like be very like talkative and outgoing. I, I, I do that now as a means to my larger goals. Um, but uh, but part of it is this like sales job and I remember like when i first started it i hated it and i like slogged through i was gonna say why i started it because there's this great um claremont mckenna graduate my alma mater named jonathan rosenberg who like i have learned 
tons from even in like a very limited number of interactions. Um, when I saw him speak, we went to Google. I was on like a Silicon Valley trip um, with my college, um, which is probably like the, my first inkling that I really wanted to be in, in tech. Um, and he just said, what I've done in my career is ride the wave. You shouldn't care about you know, where you are on the wave, what your position is, just like ask if you're on the right wave. Is this one, you know, going to break farther than others? Is it a big one? Like, and at that time, it was like, in 08, I was leaving equities, like very disillusioned. That was the last job I was talking about where like, you know, lost my shirt, personal funds. Um, and I was like, I don't want like, I was like, equities are like a shell game. I don't want to like, until I understand it's better, I don't want to do this. Um, and then I, I, so I, I took this job selling on for him just because like the, the economy was a disaster. It was a blow up. I was like, okay, if anything's a clear right wave to be on, it's selling non-performing loans. <laughs> like this is the time to do it. Um, and I hated that job for about like maybe like two to four weeks. And like, I remember, and the other reason I took it, my mom encouraged me to take it. And part of the reason she said like the, the guy who I was working for was like, he started in like repossessing cars and moved all the way up to international fixed income sale, like leading them at Chase. And so like just his story, the way we interacted, like I was like, I want to work, like I more wanted to work for Steve than I wanted to like work in sales at all. And like, that was kind of the issue was like, you should go and learn from a good salesperson if you have that opportunity. And like, I remember the first, like the first time that I actually was like, oh, like I, I can do this job. I called up some like bank person because like actually I was looking to source loans with my cold calls as well as like find the right institutions to buy the packages of them. And I I was talking to this guy for maybe like two seconds and he hung up on me. And I was just like, like I had some bad reactions to it. And so like it was like basically that ruled off my, like, I didn't even say anything about it. I just moved on with my day. But we'd have lunch together. And he was asking me about my day. And I was just like, yeah, you know, this guy, like, hung up on me in the middle of me talking. And he just, like, stopped and he put his hand up. He was like, who did that? <laughs> and I was like, I told him the name. And he was like, come with me. And, like, and, like, it was in the middle of lunch. Like, literally, we were, like, leaving our lunches, like, halfway eaten. And, like, he gets up. He, like, like we go to his office. He puts it on speakerphone. He, like, calls the guy. And he was like, he was like, did you talk to like, did you talk to my associate, George Kalis, earlier? Like, and, and the guy goes, yeah. And he goes, he's like, and he says who he is. He like gives his bio. And then he proceeds to just like rip this guy a new one, like right in front of me. And like, and it's just like, it's the classic, like, you know, good general, like, you know, you could see why this guy succeeded. Cause like from there, like I didn't dread the call as much and i like like the job and like i said i felt like i could do the job because i felt like someone had my back and like it didn't matter and like it was no like it was no longer like oh like what if this guy like one of this person like hangs up on me or turns me down i was more like oh like i'd like to see that again like <laughs> i'd like to see steve like choose someone else out on my behalf like not just because he was there for me but it was just like entertaining like to be in that, like, see, this guy basically thought he was, like, he was, like, at some mid-level bank and thought he was, like, you know, so, like, he was probably, like, oh, God, like, I pissed off the wrong person. Um, but, yeah, that was, like, that's when I really, like, and, like, those skills, like, especially, like, raising money now, like, whatever, like, back to there, like, it's just, it's so much easier to just, like, and you can't let that stuff get to you. You can't let people turning you down get to you or like your message not resonating. And like, you know, and it's even just like the difference between doing something like like my job now where I really believe in what I'm doing and like selling non-performing loans where I was more like it was just a job. Um, it just like makes it that much easier to just build those skills, build that like thick skin as an associate um, was super helpful. 
what prompted all of this? Was it very much something about a failure? As in, like, the failure to get the call right, or right? something like that. And what would really prompt it, the, the eye-opening lessons, if you want to call it that way, is, yeah, I'm assuming that everybody in the finance world is always, like, cutthroat and everything just because there's failures left and right, but you just got to do something about it. You just got to you just gotta realize that, like, that is a solvable problem. It's not a problem that you cannot you cannot uh, find, a, find a solution to at the end of the day. So great, great story there. Maybe I could probably throw in this, like, is this, is this a good term to be saying that associates would be more front of the house versus analysts being back of the house? Or did I get my terms completely wrong or do I not know anything how people just consider? Yeah, basically. I, I, I think associate, associate is like kind of like, you know, you might even have an associate that's more of like kind of like a personal assistant. It's just like it could be, a, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a title, it's a blanket title that you give someone to dress them up a little bit when they're doing like some kind of menial work. But you're right. Like, I would say, like, back of the house tends to not be viewed as menial work. Like, it's kind of like you're viewed as, as, as smarter, like, more respected as, like, as back of the house, you know? Because you're feeding the, as an analyst, you're feeding the associates information, you know? Like, that they go out and use. Um, so, yeah, but, like, I, I'd say basically you're right but like and it's different in different careers like associate could definitely be like better in in other careers and analysts could actually be lower um but in finance like yeah as as i started by saying like you never want to and like i've i've seen some stories of this with people you never want to assume because someone's an analyst that they're low on the totem pole i've seen that go very badly for people, especially like when they see like an analyst that's like older and they assume like, oh, like you haven't advanced in your career. Like that is a mistake. I, I absolutely love the perspective that you're sharing over here. Cause of course, like we take the equivalent on the tech side of being like, we don't really have like a front of the house or back of the house, but you do see these, like you need this partnership of whoever's feeding information to whoever and how the synergy app actually works and the assumptions about what somebody does has always burned people. I feel like whether you're in tech or in finance, it's always a thing. So I'm, I'm really glad you're just putting like the perspective onto that. Cause, uh, it does help. Cause eventually, even after doing a lot of those, different roles and seeing so many war stories left and right. A significant part of, of your journey was into that. Do you mind just giving a bit of context in terms of where you started there? And at what point from there did you end up going to Prospera after? Because I feel like that was a good amount of time. Yeah, I'll go a little further back because Instadat was started based on my last full-time job where I was a management associate, which like, it's kind of funny. That's like a bigger, like a bit of a bigger title, but I was literally doing entry-level positions. Like I was rotating around, like I got my license to land, my real estate license. Like I was going around, this was this big mortgage and real estate um, fund conglomerate where um, essentially it was a pretty boring job, but I did learn a lot. Um, and like, I, that's when I started like building my own algorithms in Excel um, in the night. And, and basically, uh, which my girlfriend at the time loved. <laughs> like, work a long job and then go home and like work when I got home. Right. Yeah. Um, that like my beginning to get like my beginning to make algorithms. Um, but basically like the, the thing that spring me in my, my first company was, uh, or incident was that I actually figured out a way by like, and I think everything we're going to talk about from here is really just like, I think combining what I learned in value investing and like scaling that up with, increasingly better technology but like at the beginning it was just like you know excel like i was literally what i did was i actually figured out and this was like a, a really like i would say formative call and how i think about finance as a whole which is i was like rotating around these entry level positions i was like a mortgage associate um so like collecting payments and i talked to this one guy and i was always just like i mean the nice thing about being a, like a management associate as opposed to like a uh uh, like a normal entry level position is like I had job complete job security. Like if I screwed up on that call, like or didn't collect a payment or whatever, no one was gonna fire me for that. I was explicitly learning. Um, so there's one guy, and like I was actually very explicitly learning, and I didn't like do the calls the same way as other people. And this one guy said like he was like he was a a, a neurosurgeon in Hawaii, and I was just basically like. Um, so I see, like, you know, by the way, like, this isn't my real job. I uh, like, I don't care what you tell me. Like, I'm not even, gonna, I don't even need to take notes on this. I'm just asking. Like, I see 
you have an expensive car, you're making the payment. You have another house, you're making the payment. You're not making this payment. Like, why? Like, just be honest. And he was like, okay, you want a year? I'll tell you. And he's like, my house is 40% underwater. Like, I think I got like a criminal appraisal on this thing, especially how things have play played out. Like, why would I like pay into this asset that like I could only hope is like an even asset on the longer term? Like, why would I do that? It's like, I'm just not going to pay this for two years. I'm going to collect the money and like, I'll just pay the rest of my houses in cash. Like, like, I don't care. Like, I'll buy a new house that's like at a discount. So it's like the reverse that I could actually see appreciation on. He was like, it was like, by the way, is the other house that I have. <laughs> like, and, uh, and I was like, oh, like that was one end. And then on the other end, and this is just like the most Texas thing ever. There's this thing called Texas Tuesday, where like the first Tuesday of every month, 180 days, if you're more than 180 days late, the sheriff shows up, evicts you from your house. Like no ifs, ands, or buts. There's no like, there's no like, oh, I filed for bankruptcy like that. Or like, there's these tricks you could pull in like, say, Florida, where you could not pay your loan for like three, four years, depending on like how well notices were sent and everything. So I took that. But at the time, everybody was like, oh, it's all about intent and ability to pay and like your debt to income ratio. And I basically saw people fail like three times. And I was like, no, it's not about that. I like see people like on the other side, this other guy in Hawaii that has plenty of money, like is not doing anything, is not paying. And then I see people in Texas that are calling me desperately on Monday night where like, where I'm just like, you make like $20,000 a year. Where did you come up with this like $15,000 check? And like the funniest part about that is they don't want to tell you. It probably came from their parents or like whatever, or maybe like more like, but it was just like, I was like, no, it has nothing to do with debt to income ratio. It has everything to do with these like incentives set up by these state laws. So I took the state laws, I converted them to math. Um, and basically like that model, like, and I was just in Excel, I was using like, you know, I was, th there were two things that I did. I... I looked at like the average or like the, you know, the median timelines of foreclosure. And then I adjusted that based on like what notices were sent and if it needed to be restarted and everything, which they had no way to do before me. Um, and, and basically, uh, I'm not going to drag anyone through the mud. Let's just say, basically, I wasn't fairly compensated for actually algorithms that I'm told, like that I was told, like, are still used today that I made. I made a real estate pricing algorithm. I made a loan efficiency closing algorithm. And, uh, and so they didn't really like, they, they still were not really, they were treating me like I was an entry level worker. And like, so I talked to my old boss at uh, who was at Goldman. And I said like, you know, one of the things they told me was like, I'm too big of a shark. And like, you know, I figure if I'm going to be a shark, I'm just going to come, I should come work for you. And he like looked at my model that I showed him. Um, and he was basically like, like, could you model cash flows with this? And I said, like, yeah, uh, no problem. And he said, well, then I'm not going to give you a job. I'm going to invest in your first company. And by the way, I know who your first customer is going to be. So it was like this $20 billion hedge fund, a former colleague of his, that he was right. We got along really well. Um, so like the funny thing about me as an entrepreneur is like I'm a pretty risk averse person, but I just kind of like fell into it. Like I was trying to like, I was trying to do the opposite, like literal opposite, going to work for like a, a, a big old financial institution, like not start my old th my own thing. And like from there, I actually was explicitly, what I say about like, when I say that I've been in AI for 13 years, like, and some people are like, are like, really? I was like, it was more aspirational. Like I saw the trend, but like we weren't really rolling out it, but we weren't doing any LLMs. Uh, back then, to say the least. Um, but it was aspirational in that we did, like, we were going, like, we were trying to automate things like ETL pipelines. We were trying to automate things like, you know, hyperparameter tuning, feature set building, like all of that, I think we were pretty ahead of our time on, especially as like a small um, company. And a lot of what we did is, like I said, we we were trying to, build something that could be 
you know, actually the funny thing is I shouldn't say it. Like my first attempt to like make fairness uh, a thing was I thought I was going to build an arbitrage machine at 25 and be literal Robin Hood. That's what I was like doing these consulting projects for. Um, only to find out that, uh, that like, you know, like Renaissance Technologies, Bridgewater, like already had that idea. Uh, and they, they didn't have the same goals as me. Uh, you know, because it's like, even if I could like have the same technology about them, I was never going to keep up if I was giving money away to charity. Like that's a big, you know, that's a big issue. And we'll kind of get into like my larger solution for that later, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, we did like a lot of different projects. Um, and the last one, like we did, we did like an index ad project for like one of the largest data providers in the world. We actually worked on like, I'd say the most fun project I've ever worked on was uh, predicting college loans. Um, mostly because there's no like foreclosure event in college loans. They just basically like sit there at a certain level of default. And so I like, that was the most fun like intellectual prediction that I ever worked on. Cause I actually figured out a way, cause like basically people needed to start paying again. That was the hardest thing to predict cause it was out of the blue. But basically what I did, I could track their addresses and like the median income of their ascension to like basically be like, okay, when are you gonna pay off your college loan? When you're gonna buy a house? So I was like tracking their income over time. And that's how we built a pretty accurate model on that because it was like a proxy for being like, okay, when are they gonna get to the point where they have enough money that they're gonna wanna pay off their college loan and buy a house? Um, I mean, the other thing about that that was just like hilarious I mean, hilarious and also just like exactly what you'd expect. Like where you went to college, you know, Harvard, Princeton, places like that. Like, you know, the chance of you paying, even if you stopped paying for a little bit, was just like so much higher than if you went to like most other like non Ivy schools. There was some dif differentiation, but it was like a lot of it was really just like the Ivies, like the top like 5%, I'd say, and then like everyone else. Um, but yeah, like the last project that we worked on um, was for a global, we basically were beating a global top five bank in a head to head competition, predicting their entire fixed income book. And they, like a lot of other people were basically brain draining us. And we found out a, a, a number of other um, places. But like one of the things that was great is like, as I said, like all of this is just like my career is a lot of like me kind of being like very, I should have like started Prospero earlier, maybe or maybe not. Um, but it wasn't until like, I saw that me and my small team could beat like a top, a global top five bank and a head to head data science competition that I was just like, okay, if we do this, we could probably build something that helps retail investors. Um, and we had already started like collecting and experimenting with alternative data collection on, on our own. We were doing some, some cool things there. Um, so that was the final push that I needed to start Prospero along with, um, along with just kind of this macro trend that I saw, which was that like, you know, the macro trend first got on my, my radar when I was like reading about Google's auto ML, which I think I first read about, um, about two years before I did the transition from Instadat to Prospero. Um, and, and basically, and I still think this, this is one of the things when like some people like, like I give a boring answer of like what stock to own for the next 10 years. I was like the cloud providers. Like I was just like, there's a lot of other interesting things. I'm sorry if that's boring, like the cloud providers. Like, cause I actually think eventually like among other things they are gonna kill like consulting. Because like, why would you hire like talking about like reducing head, head count, like cost. Like, I don't think they're gonna be consultants, but like, I do think you're just gonna like go to Amazon or Google and be like, reduce our head count for like reduce our headcount for us with automation. Um, but anyway, like I was just basically like, okay, like AI as a service, like how long do I really like already? I would say from that point, like the, the, the funny story that I like to tell about just like the evolution of Instadat is like when we first started pitching like our like backend, our automation capabilities, things like that, there was about 70% of institutions were like, oh, this is really cool. You're on to something. And like about 30% were like, get the fuck out of here. Like, like you think this is like cool? Like this is old, like you've got old tech. Um, but 
by the end of that eight years, like I would say it flipped. I would be like, you know, about 30% said it was cool and 70% were telling us that. So that was like there where I was like, okay, like it's gonna get harder to compete. And like the sales processes became longer. There was brain drain. Um, but it was also just like, I was just like, okay, like we're looking at all this stuff. The value of technology is going to zero. So like what is going up? If that's the case, data, alternative data, unique data. So, so the thought exercise of Prospero just before it was even a thing was how do we take our technology and create a way to trade that for data? And like, obviously what we're doing is not like an arm's length thing because I don't really believe in that, but it's like, how do we take this excellent IP we worked out, like joint IP with NYU and, and create a mechanism where we're not eaten alive in the tech game and we can compete because like i'm sure like i'm sure as a as a tech person you know it's just like data beats algorithms like if someone has like it doesn't matter how much compute how great of a team you have like if someone's got better data than you they could throw it in a regression and beat you very easily Nobody taught you to look at how to solve that problem of like mortgage, for example, or somebody who doesn't pay their mortgage. Nobody taught you to, to, to come up with a model to, to do that. And nobody taught you a lesson to be like, oh, the chance of somebody paying would be around the same time that they're able to afford a mortgage. Like nobody tells you that kind of stuff. So that's why like even we're going to jump into the process right in a second. But like even as we're showing all these different examples of why you need an analytical mind, why you need to think outside of the box to solve these problems. That's because it's hard. And if you're able to put into an idea, it kind of becomes something that is cool, just like Prosper AI. Um, but I was just emphasizing the fact that behind the scenes, I was like, you get presented so many great problems that you found solutions to. And through Instada and through people obviously helping you out on that as well throughout the whole journey, you kind of piece it together that this is valuable. And when we jump into Prospero AI at the moment, this is the culmination of, as you were saying, realizing tech, there's a certain value to it. It's getting cheaper. You want to say Moore's Law and all that kind of fun stuff where it's like, it's getting cheaper over the years and everything. So what is the next thing at the end? Um, how did you start Prospero? Or in the sense of like, was it a solo adventure? Like in the sense of like, I got this idea, I'm going to run with it and let's do that. Or the very beginning of it, even the name Prospero AI, like maybe just an origin story uh, before we don't jump into, because I want to jump into signals for sure, because that was a big word that I love diving into, but maybe just a fun, like, where did Prospero come from? Where's the name? Where did it start? Was it just uh, a C Corp that you opened in Delaware? Like, I have no idea how, <laughs> how that came to be. Yeah, I want to give, I want to give a one little like lesson on what you said. Um because it's super important. Like, you know, I think there's like behavioral economics and what I call myself at a high level is a social physicist. Like that's how I think about problems. Um, and that's how you solve problems, I think. So like when you're talking about that, like there's no like big brain solution that I had that like I had this epiphany all of a sudden, like you heard the mortgage story talking to people. I always apply that. Like the college loan thing that came from talking to people with college loans. Like, and it's just like, it's back to that first lesson I told you, there are no shortcuts. And I like apply that, it's like, you gotta dig in the weeds. And like, if you dig around for a while, yes, then you solve problems. Your brain is a great nonlinear equation solver, but you're not gonna be able to do that unless you dig in, like, unless you like get in the weeds and you figure out the problem and you figure out the people involved in the problem. Um, and okay, so we'll start with the name of Prospero, which is like, it's a little, uh, like, it's a little funny because my, one of my advisors, like, um, uh, I've worked with for a long time. He was actually my first major advisor. Um, his name is Bud Mitra. He was at, he's at the current school at NYU, which is the number one applied math school in the world. Um, and, and we had like, we were talking about this problem about maybe like spinning up like a different company when we first worked together at Insta we were talking and he actually like loved the name Prospero and I loved it too um, because like it's kind of got like the prosperity meeting and then like from the Tempest uh, where it's just like I love it like some people like like when they bring it up I'm like 
I don't want to, like it's a test and like a test to see like people. I was like, I don't want to call it a test. Like, cause I don't like anyone that doesn't know the Shakespearean character. Like, I'm not like, oh, you're an idiot. But like, I do like, I'm just like, I do like when people have that intellectual side and they get that reference. And like, you can learn a little something about each other from that. It's like an added touch point while still like really honoring, um, you know, the, the prosperity theme um, that we really want. And so, so I, when I solve problems, it's, it's very like iterative and it's very much like, um, kind of striking at the core, attempting to strike at the core of it first and being really quick to pivot. So the first, um, the first prosperity was, um, I was pitching a decentralized hedge fund. Where basically, like, I approached, like, all my best, like, tech AI friends and was just like, would you pitch in on making a hedge fund, right? I was trying to solve that, like, basically, like, accelerate our technology curve, like, without having to raise a bunch of money and compete on that level. And everybody just owned a piece of the hedge fund. And basically, like, the thing that happened and, and, and then basically with those predictions, release something like Prosper. And like, like basically give people access, do the data exchange that way. Um, and like, even like my closest friends, like some people were just like, ah, it's too early for this kind of idea. Even my closest friends were just like, George, like you need to prove that people want this first. <laughs> they were just like, I'm not gonna commit a bunch of like coding time to compete against hedge funds if I don't actually know if people would use the product or what the product is, where you're like gonna collect data. So it's just like, that's where you have to be very like, you know, responsive. And like, I was like, okay, I gotta go with my friends. And like the first, um, the first Prospero was, uh, there's various funny things about it. I mean, A, I like, I put up my own money, um, to hire a team of Indian developers. Like I was like, I was the person that worked on the back end with some of my, like some of the people that came over from Instadat to Prospero. Prospero, well, or sorry, Instadat, Instadat was acquired by an IP company called Intelligence Technologies, um, which then licensed the, the technology to Prospero to experiment. Um, of course, we ended up like pretty much building it all new um, or like actually everything today is new. Um, I was all out on my own on, on the first one. And I, I was like showing it to some of my friends and, you know, one of my, you know, one of my co-founders was one of the people that I showed it to. And what was really funny, the first Prospero just showed like the, the probability that stocks would go up or down in like a one month time. And like, I thought it was the coolest thing ever. And like, even some of my financially savvy friends we're like, what do I do with this? I was like, what are you talking about? This is great. Like, you know, you could like build little portfolios and see the probability of the, the portfolio performing. And and I showed it to my now co-founder, um, who's like a great product guy. And he's just like, he's like, George, you you you're making like the most elementary product mistake. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? He was like, you built this for yourself. <laughs> like you want this. Like nobody else wants this. You want it. And I was like, I was like, no, this is great information. He was like, is it? Like, he was like, he was like, has anyone told you that? I was like, no, like, no, no, nobody's told, nobody's told me that. No, not one person has told me this is helpful. Like, you're right. Like, and he was like, he was like, I'll, I'll start working with you on this. Like, let's, cause I do, cause like, I think you are onto something. I think your idea, like, especially like, you know, using it to collect alternative data that ultimately like disrupts the financial industry because that's really what we're doing. We have this short term, like, you know, results oriented, bring people into the fold, give them a lot more value than we're like, we're not really asking for anything from people other than like some of our paid products. But like, there's a lot of free stuff that we're giving away that works incredibly well that doesn't happen in finance. And like, actually like one of my, one of my biggest satisfactions in this journey and kind of get back to a little more of the like is like all the people that just were like so 
like not only not only like like kind of dismissive but disrespectful when i would talk to them about it and just be like don't you know don't treat us like we're idiots you're the idiot like if this was valuable at all you wouldn't be giving it away for free like you wouldn't do it like get like you know and and there were just people that were like really nasty about it but you know you can't let that get to you that's part of like finance so you know when i met my my first co-founder um we started working on like we were like we were like looking at the product a little bit um and then my second co-founder was actually like his twin brother like we were kind of working on like at the beginning we were just kind of like oh like well you know if we're gonna do like tech consulting maybe we want to use this old platform that like to grease the, the wheels and so we kind of like all started working and then it just like became apparent like we like like as both of them got to know the idea more like you know i used to say that it's kind of like you know this is kind of like my life's mission prospero but i really felt like it became our mission like and that extends as the team grows too and that's why it's just so important to pick the right co-founders for the right reasons because like i'll never like i had a bad like my last co-founder i had like a bad experience with where it was actually just like when we would get short on funds regardless and he was the technical co-founder regardless if he delivered on his estimates he would actually ask for more money as salary like than he did before he's like oh i gotta build my nest egg in case this fails which is just like the worst and he would like threaten to leave if i didn't like basically pay his salary ransom i wasn't drawing salary but like i do remember like the first time after we built like kind of v2 of the app and i like came to both my like them and i was like look i like thought we'd be able to raise money now like we're just not like we're not getting the engagement i don't think this is the it and then like you know one of them just like interrupted me and then he was just like then we'll build it back and like it was just such a different experience than like that like the last one where i was like i thought they were gonna chew me out and they were there instead they were like no we're in this i absolutely appreciate this like contrast and the fact that you're able to share this distinction of like having a good co-founder because you look at a lot of, a lot of companies who have co-founders and it always seems rosy it always seems like oh yeah they get along so well they started in the garage and then next thing you know they built this they built that but you you're able to put into words the fact that, yes, there is bad experience in this life of co-founding projects. There is stuff that you learn from it, and there's stuff that's very unpleasant behind that. So I'm very appreciative of that because it's very hard to find anybody who's able to say, hey, look, this sucked. This absolutely sucked, and this is why I'm going to make it better, which you're currently living at the moment. Um, I love this founding story of, of Prospero in the sense of, like, there was a lot of pieces together. Initially, when you were saying that, hey, you have the resources of engineering, what do you do in this role then? You do the product stuff, you do the design stuff, you do the operations stuff, you do the support stuff. And then you're able to realize that you're like, wait, maybe my product sense isn't as great. I'm not saying that you're a bad product product person at the end of the day. I'm just saying that like, there's a point where you realize that, hey, you didn't talk to people about this and you didn't ask for inputs on that. And that is very important. And you're able to be like, leaning on some other individuals be able helping you with that so i love seeing the the awareness behind what you're describing and even for me to eventually ask you in a sense of like i could even describe prosper you could tell me if it's correct or not with the product itself where dem democratizing democrat i don't know how to say the word but like putting the data in people's hand how you do it with, with prospera at least is that it's an app right it's something that is accessible it's something that is very still pretty new because if you think about all the institutional apps they've always been on the on the computer they've always you had to log in online on your browser and everything and then with prospero it's an app that actually uh at the beginning has a fun survey funny enough that actually kind of gauges in a sense of like your intent right everything you've described there was a level of risk to it whether it's like high risk low risk and once you go through a bit of that profiling the survey you have so many options of information to figure out like what is your goal long term long term short term and on the app it visually just tells you that this is a long term pick this is a short term pick and also there's a part about it tells you why it's long term pick or even some of the reasons with the signals to be like this stock stock x or whatever it is is a long term pick so that's at least how i understood prospero so far and you you tell me is this the how long did it take to get to this point of I guess, like, clarity 
of being able to show this data to people? Did it took a lot of versions behind it, or or did I even describe this very correctly? From from what? Yeah. No. No. I think yeah. I I think you did you 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 didn't say anything wrong. But I'll I'll fill in some some more things. Um. So I would say it's like really accelerated since we released our V4 of our app and it's designed by, you know, someone who was a former creative director at Apple for seven years. Um, who's, you know, one of the many people who started equity only, like that's the really amazing thing about like having a real mission. Like we have, you can bring talented people in that like want to be part of it and also see the value. Um, so it's really accelerated since then. And like, I, the funny thing about like the interaction between me and Niles and Adam, which remember that Adam's our, our CTO and Niles is, is, is our chief product officer is like, oh man, did we piss off Niles for so long with all these like product ideas, but we were just like hammering on the back end and making it better because like it just had to work as well as I wanted it to like, and basically like the first, like the first versions of it, I was really the only user because I said, if, if I can't use this effectively, like, at a very high rate, like what chance does someone who has like far less experience than me have? So we were really big on that part. Um, and then, you know, obviously it's accelerating a lot more as we like release kind of the newest version that has better onboarding, better descriptions, but it's really like the, the core thing. And like, I think, you know, there's one of the things that, you know, as, as a data scientist and, uh, and, and a real numbers guy, I'm, I'm probably a lot more spiritual than uh, a lot of my a, a lot of my compatriots um but like one of the things that like i i do believe on this journey is that like you know when we set out especially like our focus on the options markets um and simplifying it like a lot of it was like actually learning that lesson of building for other people and now i spend about 20 percent of my time and still talking to retail investors like interacting with them and like our best signal um something called net option sentiment i use it like you know beating the market like crushing it the last three years like that's the main thing i use and just because it's like really easy like you can see net net zero to 100 if like institutions are bullish or bearish in the short term options markets um and the funny story about that is it was created um because i was trying to teach people how to read options chains a lot like highly unsuccessful and like, this was one time, like a Friday afternoon, I was exhausted. Like I was talking to someone, it just wasn't going well. And I just was like, what if I told you the options markets like this or didn't like it? And, and it was just like the light bulb went off for him. And he was like, he was like, well, I don't want to learn this. If you could do that, like we could have just saved this whole like hour. Like, and I was like, great, I'm going to, and, and I got to work like building it. And the nice thing about like having that long history is we had like, many different kinds of algorithms that we built for different purposes. And like at one point, one of them was this like, like identifying, tagging, and then what later became visualizing institutional options trades. And like, it's really cool. Cause like, we just have a GameStop example where like, we just like nailed it even before the first time that went up. And so it's just like, we're doing like, uh, we're crushing some people's hopes and dreams by saying that like no institutions were in on this. Like when everybody wants to think that it's retail, it definitely um and and we had the data to prove it um but anyway like what's, what's what's really nice about that part is like when i was building that my only goal was to minimize risk like i was just like let's keep you out of trouble by not having you bet against institutions like with net option sentiment in like the short-term options markets and then our upside and downside ratings like not only have like the long-term options markets, but they layer in like analyst ratings, price targets, like some price momentum factors, like all crunched into one number. So it's just like, that's all it was built to do. Like help, like basically, you know, you say risk minimization to a retail investor and like their eyes glaze over. They don't like, cause like there are realities of like, I think people, like I think people that invest in single stocks, you know, want these two things in some like order, you know, they do want to feel the excitement of like owning something that could win big. Right. And there's that, some of that gambling instinct, but 
But I think some people want to learn. And I think that's one of the big differences between Prospero and like investing passively, which is a match for a lot of people. But like, I'd say even people that invest passively, it's still a good idea to go on your learning journey. So you can learn to identify like single stocks. But the best part, the best part about it is like, we just built it to risk minimize. And like, I am so pleasantly surprised that it's turned into like such an amazing like trade, like investing signal that could actually like lead the market. Like, I think that's like my reward for the generosity of like giving it away for free in the first place. That's where like the spirituality comes in. But it's just like, yeah, like it's even like as like, even as late as like, closing my second year about 50% above the market. Like even having like imposter syndrome a little bit of like me just being like, nope, it doesn't work like it. It doesn't, it can't possibly work this well. Like, like it, it's going to catch up with me. Like, blah, blah, blah. Like when I finished the second like full year, like I was kind of just like, like I, I kind of like reversed my thinking a little bit where I was like, well, George, you have worked on this for 13 years. And like, You've worked in it like, you know, you have a crossover of like, you know, value investing and AI, like you've built the tech, you've immersed yourself in this, like, you, how is that any different than some hedge fund manager that like, you know, beats the market time and time again? Like, I was just like, why is it, why couldn't that be you? Why couldn't these signals like be you? So it's like, yeah, I'd say this year I'm enjoying it a lot more and I'm even doing a little better. like. I think because I don't like, I'm a little less like nervous and tense about it. Like, even if I have a bad day, like I have a little more perspective of like, of like, you know, the classic finance, like looking over your shoulder, waiting for someone to come for you versus like, you know, no, you're, you're doing something good here. You put good work into it. It works like trust the signals. I think that's the big thing that's changed for me, but I do also want to give it the caveat also like. I'm not done looking over my shoulder. Like, don't let this story, like, let you get overconfident. Like, because, like, if there is one thing I still practice every day, it's like, and I will give this other piece of advice to investors. It's like, I think investors, like, invest in something, a lot of people, less experienced people, like, invest in something and then continue to assume they're right. Like, I invest in something and then I look for why I'm wrong every day like why things have changed, why like my original thesis for getting in might have changed. And like one of the things that's way easier about it and like what I think is like really cool about both like, you know, building a tool to help me, but also to help anyone, like is this idea of like my thesis kind of went from being as complicated to be like, oh, this is the business, this is what I expect to earnings. It could be as simple as like, if I see net option sentiment go below 70, I'm selling. Like no ifs, ands, or buts. And like, that's a lot, like that's, and that's something anyone can do. And like, sometimes people like are asking me for like more complicated, like even more experienced ones. And they're just like, why did you do that? I was like, because it went below this number. Like, and I'd recommend you do the same. Maybe people are gonna build automation off of Prospero as Prospero would be a trigger for future automation. I don't know if, if, if it's happening already, but you could probably, I'm sure somebody in your, in your room is thinking about something like that where it's like, Prospero triggered this, so we're doing XYZ after. Um, there's a couple of really fun things when you're mentioning in the sense of like, Winning sometimes seems easy in the sense of like once you're in a bull run, everybody's winning, right? Everybody, well, all the all the all the bulls are winning in that scenario. But as we're seeing, like the more complex part is hedging against it of when it the downturns it happens. Like that definitely is part of the game as well. So as you were saying, you definitely have to think about in the worst case scenario what could go wrong if something's going too well. Even you were saying like the the numbers don't lie. Fifty percent for for one year, and then fifty percent beating SPY for a second year. Like that's absolutely impressive. Somebody threw the number out there where they're saying like eighty percent of hedge funds don't even beat SPY to begin with, or something like that. Right? The majority of people can't even keep up with that index and being able to be significantly above it. There must be some some code you're cracking for sure. And I think I like the part also where you were saying that like there's the comfort zone of doing that, but then you also got to figure out it doesn't last. <laughs> like most of these doesn't last at the end of the day. Um, and that's, I feel like I'm not, not going to speak for you at the end of the day, but that's probably the drive that you and your team has behind is that like, it, it's 
not doesn't just stop there it just keeps on going um one thing that you've called out a couple of times and i just want to have a quick fire round maybe because like i've learned a bit just because i've done a bit of research but this is the signals right we're talking about this is literally the stuff that you could take on your app and it gives you the signals you pick a stock and it gives you the signals even the net option sentiment like it's so easy to digest as a retail investor or somebody just literally downloading the app that says like, does it feel good? <laughs> does that app feel good or not? So for the other quick fire ones that I want to ask real quickly, upside breakout and downside breakout. Do you have a quick definition of those ones that, you know, as to explain to somebody like a, like me, like a retailer, what does that represent or what exactly does that mean? Yeah. So like if you're looking at net option sentiment, right, that's basically looking at like, where institutions are, are, are like getting calls or like bets the stock is going to go up above where the stock is trading versus puts below. And we're netting that out because it's just like simple logic. You're right. Are more like, and we do a lot of that through pricing. It's just like, are people paying more to bet for it than they are like to bet against it? So we smack those two together on net options. On long term, we separate that out. So like, Upside is going to be looking more at like the demand for calls. So just the demand in the long-term options markets in terms of prices that they're paying, that the stock's going to go, that they're betting that the stock is going to go up longer term. Then we take things like price targets, analyst ratings. We're basically saying like, you know, are they, are they bullish, right? And then price momentum factors. So like the really easy way and like, you know, before we like had our live testing, we back tested like a really cool back test that we did with upside breakout was that if you bought, like it's anywhere from 10 to 50, 50 stocks on a different day, we did a five year back test where we said, okay, all the stocks that are above 80 in upside in our bell curve, um, like if we held that for a year, like how would we do versus the S&P 500? And actually like 80% of those days we tested for that one year hold, we beat the S&P 500. So we had consistency. Not just like, that's a scary thing. Sometimes there's a lot of volatility. This is consistency that we built in. And there's a really easy way to explain that. It's just like, okay, if people are betting for it in the long-term options markets, right? And they're, uh, and analysts like it, and price momentum is going in the right direction, it makes a lot of sense that those stocks would do well because you have to do well in all three of those categories to be at the top. And I would say like our most famous case study on this is with Meta. and like. The funny story about this with Meta is that like, I, I didn't learn, you know, my first boss, the one that gave me the accounting test, like another, like another very important investing lesson is he, he told me that, um, his most successful investment was a garbage company. And he was just like, it was just undervalued. People don't like to invest in garbage. It's really that simple. He was like, you should always look for the garbage. And like, you know, in the sense of Meta, Right. It's hilarious the way that I started out with this, because like, you know, I'm attracted to like for obvious reasons, like more like galvanizing leaders, like, you know, people like so like I was already inclined to not really love Mark Zuckerberg just for that. reason, And then he had like a whole like, you know, frankly, idiotic metaverse thing. Um, and like me and everybody else underestimated him. And and so in February, like Meta has been at 100 upside since February 16th, 2023. And the funniest part about this story is like, it was about, uh, it was late April that I first added Meta, even though like I saw, I, I never really saw a solid upside breakout line for that long. Normally there's like some volatility on a day-to-day -day basis. And there was times that Meta was like a hundred and the next stock was like at 90. So it was like so far up in our scale that it was like dwarfing the other companies but like i had people talk to me about it and they were just like okay like why aren't you putting meta in your portfolio it's like sitting at a, it was like well like oh, it's just basically like prospero doesn't like prospero doesn't know what an idiot mark zuckerberg is <laughs> was basically like the like, thing but it's just like that's what's so important about doing the signals the way that we did it and it's just so funny like how often you kind of have to learn these lessons as an investor and it's over and over and over again that you overlook things because of your personal bias. And like, that's what's nice about the signals. Because eventually I was like, the stock was going up. And I was like, it's at 100 of the break. And I was like, what am I missing? And like, what I was missing for not much longer is like, they started to like, I'm sure you use like PyTorch. And they started to do like a lot of interesting things 
like in like AI development and like, you know, now they have Llama. And like, so they're just becoming like a leader in open source. And like, so you look at them and you know, they are a profitable business. And like, so basically they were just being graded down and Prospero was like hammering me on this and I was ignoring it. So I think that like temporarily, um, it's been one of our biggest wins over like the long in terms of like what we, but like, I feel like that's a great lesson in both like how the signals can be useful as well as uh, as well as just like a lesson in you know value investing investing signals and the thing about it that's like that to bring it back to upside is like in order to stay at 100 upside basically like it had to have live options bets that continued to be bullish as the stock went up analysts had to keep raising their price targets maintain their buy ratings and the price momentum factors had to be there so it's just like it has to stay it's not like and that's what like some people love about prospero versus technical indicators. Because like when a stock goes up 100% like Meta does, the technical indis- indicators are gonna be like way against it, especially something like RSI. Like, but like Prospero is looking at like live options bets primarily. And some people ask me, it's like, it's like, if it's there, it's live as of three minutes ago. You know, it updates every three minutes. So like, if it's at 100 upside breakout, it means institutions are right now bullish on the stock and like, you should trust them is what I've learned. Trust that over like whatever, like you might be thinking about perhaps Mark Zuckerberg personally, you know? I think that is so cool in the sense of like, cause you described so much behind the scenes, everything you've described in terms of having that one signal, it's cause you, your team, people at Trostero, the machine itself is putting that much work and giving the user, as you were saying, like it it gives it to the user for free even cause anybody could download the app to just be like, look at this indicator. Trust that it works. I mean, to a certain extent, you're a human. You have to make your own decision at the end of the day. But trust to an extent that there is homework that is done behind it. And that also maybe is the reason why nowadays you feel like you're a bit more comfortable than back then where you're always looking behind your shoulder because there is confidence. There's data that backs behind a lot of that. So such a cool breakdown of what you're describing as upside breakouts, downside breakouts, and the long-termness of, of different options. Um, the... Other ones that I want to make sure, I only got two other ones that I listed down because I want to ask about these two signals, but dark pool rating and net social sentiment. Those, I believe, are on the shorter term, but maybe something to, to summarize or even to describe to Perry what these two signals are, just because I'm... Yeah, so what I like, dark pool rating keeps me out of trouble, even though it's like a bit complicated. So just to give a quick education on dark pools and maybe something people don't know about dark pools. Like dark pools were actually created for transparency. Because before, institutions could basically make these big trades with each other outside of the market. Like, not always like they weren't necessarily supposed to do that, but because ultimately, and this is like the number one lesson I could say to retail investors um, in terms of just how to think about institutions, is institutions don't care about retail investors. Like, you losing money to them is incidental. And like the phrase that I always say is like, you know, you're in the market with robots and giants and giant robots. And like, you gotta try not to get stepped on. Like this idea that you wanna take them on is silly. You wanna walk in their shadows, right? So I think the very important, like, and that's kind of what we set up about Ross Barrow. So like, it's, it's, there's actually some added transparency in the dark pools because you could actually see where people are, are transacting. But ultimately like, you can transact at a different price in the dark pools than the market price. And you could wait about 24 hours before that even like impacts the market price. Like that's just like what it is on paper. So like basically what we do, what we always say with our signals is we simplify while making more information rich. And a lot of people talk about like percent traded on the dark pool, which is one of the things that we use. But like, for example, if you have a stock that trades like only a million shares a day, you could easily have 90% traded in the dark pool. But that's like very different than like Apple, which you like, you're going to like 60% in the dark pool is a high number for Apple. So you need something to do that. So one of the things we do is we add in, you know, shares outstanding, shares traded. So we get a sense of like um, the churn in addition to the percent trade. So when you're looking at dark pool, you're looking at a number like relative to the size. Like, and I think the best way to look at that is like how much institutions might want to not move the price in the market. That's why they trade. 
Dark Pool. So like, I think a really easy example for people to understand, I mean, maybe not the easiest, but like this, these are not easy concepts to understand. So please ask questions if you have them. Um, if, if, a, if an institution is heavily short a stock, so they're betting it's gonna go down, right? Shorts are actually a loan. So like you, when you short a stock, you actually get the money of the stock at that price in your account. And then you close that loan when you buy the stock back and you essentially, the difference is that. So understandably, if you're a heavy, in a heavy short position, like people that talk short squeezes, if you want to cover your position, you might not want to cover it in the market, like a big chunk of it, because that could move up the price heavily and like really screw you over in terms of like what happens. So what you might even do is continue to short it a bit on the market while you cover it on the dark pool. So it's not gonna into like, <laughs> so it's not gonna impact the market price, right? So the important thing, and actually there's some really interesting data on like GME and trading in the dark pool yesterday on trading halls. If anyone wants to dig into that, it's super interesting to say the least. Um, in that there were tons of activity during market halts in the dark pool. Um, and basically the way that we describe that, like one of the things that drives me crazy about current products is like they're these dark pool prints and like people that describe them are like, okay, we saw this dark pool print and like the stock is trading at 100 and like bullish above 120 and bearish below 80. And I always hated those products because I'm just like, yeah, if the stock goes up 20%, you should be bullish. Like you haven't told me, like you haven't told me anything real. Um, so like the way we talk about dark pool and the way I use it, and sometimes I like filter it out in our screeners or things like that. It's just basically like, I consider that to be like a stop sign. Like, like where it's just like a very high dark pool as a retail trader. Like you don't know if the price is being masked in the dark pool because someone is bullish or someone is bearish or they're expecting the stock to go up or it goes down. So I'm just like, given the fact that you don't know that and there's a lot of activity, it's just kind of a stay away metric for me. That's how I use it. Or like for some people, I, I do like, that's how I use it. There's some people that will see like high short pressure, high dark pool, and they'll fit that to a narrative. They'll be like, okay, like this could be about to like squeeze or like go in a certain direction. That's how more advanced traders use it. But I would say if you're if you're not an advanced trader, and like I would define that as anyone with like less than five years experience, and also someone that like hasn't had uh, I'd say a, at least one or two years of making money, like just long short or even in options making money, um, you should look at that number as a stop sign. You anything above eighty, you should be like, okay, let me stay away from this until. <laughs> I see it go down a little, or sometimes I'll exit positions. Like I'll exit positions because I'll just be like, look, I don't know which way people are betting on this. I'm just gonna get out before, you know, I, I, I look at it similarly to earnings is how I look at it. Where it's just like, you know, this could go big in one direction or the other. And like, I like to make my bets if I have clarity on a direction and like, Dark, high dark pool rating inherently lacks clarity. I understood all of that. I hate to say that. Like, I feel like I understood all of that. I, obviously, like, I personally, I do trade here and there for, for a couple of years now. And I do understand that I have maybe, like, some, some understanding, some concepts. But the way you're describing that, there's activities that happen even outside of what you see of the actual open market and everything. And the fact that you're kind of bringing those understanding into a number that could be used by any user looking at it is even more impressive uh, to, to be like, follow these numbers as a guidance. Follow these stop signs. Some people just burn them completely. I get it. The California rule, sure. <laughs> um, but at the same time, you're able to, to at least have a chance. The, everything you've been saying, everything that I understood from Prospero is that you're giving people a chance. You're not saying that they're going to win. It's just giving them an actual um, indicator for a lot of it. I actually say something like, I think a lot of companies overpromise, but like the one thing is like, I, I agree with you, but I actually take it a step further when I talk about like using Prospero. I'm just like, my promise to you and nobody's ever come back and said I'm wrong is like, you will do better with Prospero than you did before. If you look at the numbers, if you just integrate it, you will do better. Like you might, if you're losing a lot of money, you might lose less. Like I don't promise gains because I think that's dangerous. 
Like, I do promise that they'll do better. And the other thing you said that I, that I, that I forgot to circle back to that I agree with is just like, even I, investing is about confidence. Like, you should look at Prospero, integrate it into your existing plan. Like, there are some people that use Pri Prospero as like a primary source now. Great. Like, they've built to that and they've built a process around it. But like, the big thing for me is like, if you're not a short term trader, don't look at the short term bull list and be like, oh, Prospero said this. So I'll like, like, there's a lot of things that I'll see on that list that I'll like say, look at the technicals on and be like, at the very least, this is too big of a risk for me and just like filter it that way. So I think that that's super important. Like nothing, Prospero, not anything is magic. And I always remind people like hedge funds go out of business every year with a lot of smart people. Like if those people can still mess up, you certainly can. That is the mature part to it. The disclaimer is a bit of it like everything could go up, everything could go down, but then you do have help. The whole point is helping people. And I think that's really some some lesser common thing in, in the world of sharks and, and, and finance and everything, which is really, really interesting. Um, I, I feel dumb so far, not even asking a little bit about like tech. Um, obviously, when you're talking about apps, right, you got your front end that gets built, at least on the iOS side, Swift nowadays, probably the most popular one. And on the Android side, I believe Kotlin is winning everything. Flutter is a bit over there to build all your Android apps. Uh, that's at least my understanding for a lot of that. Um, is that is that how you planned it or you and your team planned it? Was it was the idea that like you build an iOS app, you build a you build an Android app, your backend, I'm assuming, what is it in finance? The most popular would be something like C++. So they'd have like even Java out there. I mean, the 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 high performance code, I don't even know what's the term for it. Like a lot of it is mostly, I believe, C++ nowadays. But what, what can you share? I'm not asking for the actual recipe or the IP or behind all of it. What, what, what can you tell us about the technology at, at Prospero? I'm, I, I got to geek out a bit about this. Yeah, it's, it's pretty easy. Like we're, we're doing... Um... We use React Native just to make it easy to, you know, be in both, like, both app stores, not too difficultly. Then, you know, we're pretty much just, like, on the back end, we're, we're a Mongo, where we use BigQuery for, like, some of the heavier, like, you know, data science lifts. Then Python wrapped around all that. We use some Apache Airflow, too, for scheduling um, some of the Kubernetes. That's it. No, that's all all familiar in a sense of like you make it you make it sound like it's really a person's idea more than anything. The barrier wasn't the tech, as far as I understood. Like the barrier was not the tech. The barrier is being able to see what is missing, what you wanted to build behind it, and I think that's always really cool behind that. Um, one thing I could probably ask, at least on the 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 projection side, what I mean projection is what is next for Prospero. What who gives you work in a sense of, do you just decide a feature? Do you just come up, wake up one day to be like, that would be a great feature and I'll add that. Or would it be something like a request from a user? Or would it be something, a request from a stakeholder? Like maybe that process of where do your ideas or your next features come from? So we basically have a process where we organize user requests into surveys and then that dictates our roadmap. And our roadmap right now, we have like, I, I think our most exciting pro product at the end of the summer, um, is going to be trade alerts. Um, and that's just basically like, you know, one of the things, it's the next evolution. The way we think about earning trust is gradual, right? So we started off simple with the app. Then we did an investing letter that built a little on top of that. Then a trading letter for more complex strategies, you know, then these alerts are going to be one step further where we're going to be doing what everybody has been asking us to do for a while, which is just tell us what to do. Um, but a big thing for us is we wanted to, to have a lot of trust before that. Because like these, like a lot of people don't really understand that like trade alerts, you know, you can have a bad month. You can even have a bad like quarter, like with a really amazing product that on the longer scale is gonna work really well. So, so personally, I found that too risky to roll something out like that until we had like a fairly large loyal user base who's like, if someone refers you to the trade alerts, they're like, this sucks, it's not working. Like, just like, well, it has worked for like three years. Like, maybe maybe this is just a bad month. Like, I think if you don't have that perspective, like you're not launching a product in, in the best way you can. Then, you know, from there, we're gonna do Discord. Like, we have a Discord, but we're gonna do something that's like even more, like I would say, maybe for people that are like technical traders, like or whatever, like we're gonna give like our test data science, like a lot more information. 
um, in that as we roll out more and more. And then that will actually be like the product hub where we add to stuff based on like what we share, what works. Um, you might even look at that as like open sourcing some of it. We're like more, are more tech savvy, like to your point, like might build their own things that they that we'd let them hand out. Like give us and, APIs. Like, we just want yeah. APIs. Give us APIs. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> no, I mean we will never give API access. Like I'll share some Google Sheets. Um, but we're too worried about like basically hedge funds like grabbing our data. Um but uh and like losing that like you know that 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 alpha protection that we've really worked hard to to maintain um then we have a web app that's going to be you know a little bit different like that's going to be um like ad monetization so free free with ads like like more charting things like that um and then from there you know we're just gonna scale those products like build up like marketing education like before we start doing the really cool stuff, which is like our banking and wealth management products and like that data trade that we talked about, where it's just like, we originally did it like in V3 of the app. We actually, we eliminated with V4 because some people were a little confused by the questions, but basically even just asking people to donate their, their data, we had 58% of those, our users actually donated data. So that's really encouraged when we just ask them. Like if it doesn't work at, at our next phase of growth, we might lock the app and say, hey, if you want to use it today, you can answer these questions or you can, you know, pay for a paid version of it. Um, and that's when we get to do really cool stuff. And the example that I always like love to give because like I felt spurned by this and I'm sure other people did is like we want to be able to ask people questions like what's your temperature and be able to model a pandemic in real time and essentially like do slash take away what the U.S. senators did when they were like, you know, looking at hospital data, reassuring the public while they shorted the market and gained that private arbitrage. Like we would make that more of a public utility embedded in products for, for the people generating the data, which would in turn give more of a reason to give us more data. Because like that's, that's the relationship as it should be, not the current one where like hedge funds are buying like real-time credit card swipes, camera data, satellite images, web traffic, like location data, like all the creepiest stuff you could possibly imagine, like without consent, like, and giving no benefit, actually using that to trade against the people that generate it. Like if you're like, the word disruption gets overused, but if you're talking about like a relationship that needs to be disrupted, it's people making billions and billions of dollars of data generated by people that's given, that's purchased without consent and used against them. Like, this just seems like an obvious, like, you know, and I get, I get asked all the time, like, well, why aren't you a hedge fund today? Why aren't you a wealth manager today? You're being Mario Bava, all that stuff. And I'm just like, because like, people don't give their data to like even Vanguard. Like if Vanguard asked me to give them their data, I'd be like, no, we have a transaction. I'm buying your mutual fund. Like you could screw off with that. Like you're making tons of money on this. And they certainly wouldn't give it a hedge fund to a hedge fund. So it's just like, yeah, like we're playing the long game and it's just like, and, and doing a very human thing. Like what is the best way to get trust? You give it. So it's just like, if people are just like, well, later when we roll this out, like, well, how do I know my data is going to go to predictions for us? And just like, cause we've already been giving them to you for like, for free, like, you know, for years, like, that's how, you know, like we've already been doing it before you did shit for us. So like, that's how, you know, I hate myself for sharing that sentiment. I, I don't, I don't know if I want to throw the tax companies in there, you know, like all the ones that like already get all the tax information and then they become the middle person, all that. I like this sentiment that you have right now. I don't want to double echo it, but I definitely understand like why you have the passion and why you have the reason to work on this mountain of work. I don't think you're short of any work at the moment. And one of the cool things is that the velocity that you, you, your group can reach just in velocity to be like talking about these feature, releasing these features, release, releasing that. As a technology person, I feel like that's kind of the cool part about it is that you can move to your own pace. You're not dictated by, you know, a lot of maybe like behind the scenes OKRs or whatever. You probably do have OKRs at the end, but like a bigger red tapes and bigger like, frameworks that are just much slower than i guess your current operation at the moment so that's really really cool um i want to come back to george maybe in the sense of 
what helps you run your day today? What tools? What what's your favorite apps? Like as a as a person who has so many things to keep track of, right? Like maybe you have a good note taking app. I don't know. Um, maybe like what's your top like three apps that help you run your day today? It could be whether like a note taking app or maybe you're a Slack person that you have to have Slack. Like, what does that look like for you at the moment? A lot on Slack. We try to organize as much in like Google Docs as we can, so people have people have visibility. I use like the app Tweak for like my to do list. Um, but like everything else is like pretty non traditional that I do it. Like I, I've had it to become more traditional. There was a funny like moment in my late twenties. I used to not have a calendar, and I used to say like, if it's important, I'll remember it. And I never missed an important meeting. Like I would remember when I had them. Um, but I actually like, I, I scheduled like a, a party at my house, like the same day as my dad's like 65th birthday. And that was just like a complete calendar failure. And like, so I, I've had a calendar since then, but what I do really, I, I, I believe in under scheduling. Like that's my like big thing. I think only essential meetings, only like, like being very flexible, like, and I like, I'm a, I've studied like the philosophy of creativity a lot. And I think like creativity is the most important thing any of us have. Like, and the way that I look at it, it's just like, like output versus creativity. It's like, if I have one good idea every day, that's so much more important than me, like, like reaching out to X number of people or like writing documents or like whatever. And like, I like the big contrast. And like, even as I was learning this, it became obvious. Like I remember at my, like being miserable at my like full-time jobs when I was younger, just like the conversations I had with myself in my head, where I was just like, oh, George, you got to get this done. And it wasn't getting done. And then I would be like, oh, we're never going to leave work. And it was just like, a, it was just like negative cycles around pushing myself to do things and fighting myself when I didn't want to do them. So like now, I have like a way different, like way different policy towards that where I'm just like, if I face any resistance, I just don't do things. Like I don't do them. I'll go for a walk. Like, you know, I told you I was going to the pool later. Like I'll do things like that. Like where I'm just like doing the opposite and that works better than anything else. Like cause sometimes I'll have new ideas and like the other rule that I, that I abide by that actually I've, I've taught to other people that are like, oh my God the best thing and it's like so simple and it's like you always have more time than you think like i'm always just like and you don't want to blow anyone off but in terms of like ideas if there's any discretion like you would always think that you're like setting an important deadline for yourself but like that passes and you find solutions like more often than not it's so much more important to like lean into like doing what feels natural and like, that's, you know, I mentioned like spirituality as like a part of that. Like I like, I've made some amazing market flip calls, like where I've been right. I think three big ones I've called just like right each time. And like, but I've probably written about 12 email, like started 12 newsletters calling market flips. And like the difference between the one that I send and the one that I don't is I'm just like writing it and something doesn't feel right. And I'll like bail. And there's been a few times where I've been like about to press send and like it just didn't. And like, I'm closer to 50-50 on those to be clear. Like I wasn't wrong on all of them. It just like something wasn't like all the way there and clicking for me. And I feel like if you develop that kind of relationship with yourself, where you can like have an honest conversation with yourself, about if something feels good, if you want to do it, like it doesn't like a market flip is like the hardest thing I can think of, which is why like I did it. But there's just like so many little examples where it's just like results are better if you just trust like whatever is going on inside that's telling you that you want to or don't want to do something. Yeah, and as I keep on saying, you don't you don't learn that in school. So I feel like everything that you're sharing is really backed by the the experience and like the burns the scars by everything behind it and that kind of helps you you know nowadays you lead projects you lead people you manage so many different things and one thing i do want to take the opportunity maybe maybe for the the end of the show is 
one thing that you also manage a lot is your wardrobe. Um, you've showed up to a lot of great shows, great episodes, great TV and everything. And it's hard to miss it. It's hard to miss those great shirts that you do have with you. What's the story behind them? Or what? who sources it? Do you source it? Are they gifts? Like, if, oh, like what's the oh, story no, behind I source, those? I source the shirts. But so there's a great story, like, you know, behind a lot of the things I have. Um, so I like started, I started like thrifting a little in college, just things that I like found. It was like a bit of a hobby for me and my friends. It actually started where like one of my good friends from college and I got into a silk shirt finding competition. We were like, we like had to find the best silk shirt um, and we would thrift pretty aggressively for it. Um, and one of these really cool shirts that I bought in like Venice Beach when I was, I went to school, school like 30 minutes east of LA it was actually like this like colorful shirt with like angelfish on it. Like, uh, and like, I probably got this when I was like, you know, 26. And, and a few years later, you know, I actually met one of my best friends in life because he just came up to me at an event and it was like a crypto event, which is like, I'm not even really in crypto, but this is the funny part. And he like puts his hand on my shoulder and he goes, a fisherman can always spot another fisher. And, and like, we just like hit it off. We started talking from there. We're like very similar, you know, kind of people. And like, like, like a true investor, I started to be like, oh, I think there's an ROI on shirts. Like, I think like if I'm like getting this, like, you know, if I'm getting this kind of feedback, meeting great friends, like I started, I started to invest in more. And like, there is, there's a tangible, like some of my favorite people that I've met, like in business have been because they, I'm at a conference and they came up to me and were like, I had to talk to you in the shirt or like whatever, like some like cooler shirts are like that. And it's just like, yeah, like that's one thing. And actually it's like, so the funny part now is like I, each time I've been in the market by, you know, a significant amount, I've bought myself a very nice shirt that I've stocked on Poshmark. They're both Versace shirts. And I actually cheated a little bit and bought myself a Versace like shirt and, and shorts combo uh for the berkeley speech that i gave i was like this is cool too i gotta like i gotta i gotta do that but you know i, I it's like online thrifting um but yeah it's just like life's about connection and i just feel like the more you put yourself out there it's like it's all me and like actually someone like came up to me about like one of the versace shirts at like a bar and it was like a little bit like nagging me one time i was like you're just trying, like, you just wear shirts like that to get attention. And that was their intro to me. And I was like, excuse me, I love this shirt. Like, and I was like, this was my reward. Like, I actually, the first time I beat the market, I was actually investing. And I bet the company funds. Like, and that was a bit stressful. Like, so I was like, you have no idea what I went through to get this shirt. Like, this is like, this is not about you. This is about me. Like, I love how I feel in this shirt. Like, I'm so like, I was like, you're saying more about yourself than me by coming up to me like that. The passion behind how you talk about the shirts and what the shirt expresses and what they mean to you. I think everybody, if you have the time, just like look it up. I mean, even this is the best time. Where can people find more of George and where can people find more of Prospero? What's what's the uh, the best ways? Yeah, I mean, you can go to our website, Prospero.ai. That's how you sign up for our newsletter, get our app, then like Prospero underscore AI. We'll get to you to our YouTube, our TikTok, like probably easiest to find the shirts on TikTok. You could just scroll through. I kind of actually have an obsession to not repeat shirts on TikTok. So, so you can actually like scroll through a lot and, and, and not see the same shirt, but there's a lot of, there's certainly a lot of, a lot of good ones uh, on there. And then uh, on X, not as shirt oriented, but that's where you'll get a lot more of our, uh, you know, our tips are like, you know, how other people use it, you know, it's, it's a, and, and then our, our channels, like both like YouTube, TikTok, those are more about like investing lessons. So you'll get two different flavors there. Um, and like, yeah, it's it, like one of the, I think we have like over 16,000 followers on TikTok now, which is like the funniest thing. Cause like, I am not, I'm not a social media person. And I also don't edit our videos or anything. Like I have zero skills like that. So the last thing I ever expected was to see like a big following on TikTok, but that's been fun. 
And of course, all the links will be shared in the show notes down below, so you guys should definitely check it out over there. But hey, you keep on saying you're not a social person, but you do have a net social sentiment signal out there. So I feel like there's a lot more correlation than you can imagine behind all of that. But honestly, I think from your back-to-back stories that every two seconds, I'm just like, wow, but like, wait, you thought about that? I think on behalf of myself and on behalf of a lot of people, I just want to say thank you again for being on the show and sharing so many great stories. Yeah, this was a lot of fun, as expected. Thanks so much for having me on. And of course, go check out Prospero AI, and I, on that end, will catch you on the next one. I'll see you guys later. And that was George Kalis, CEO of Prospero AI. All the links are shared in the description notes below. Go check them out. If you would like to be on Podcast Room by Software Engineer, reach out to us. Just email contact at paritsu.com. Can't wait to have you on the show. Once again, thank you so much for listening to Podcast Room by Software Engineer. Don't forget to hit the follow button on your podcast app and leave us a review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. It's completely free. And if you want to tell your friends about Podcast Room by Software Engineer, that's totally cool as well. Anyways, I am Paris you, and I'll catch you on the next one. Big love.